We are in the midst of a sermon series we're calling What If, as we imagine the future of our church and our ministry together. And each week we're looking at a different what if question. And this Sunday, we're considering the question, what if we as a church move from admiring Jesus to following Jesus? And our scripture text today to help us in this conversation is Luke chapter 9, verses 51 through 62. When the days drew near for Jesus to be taken up, he set his face to go to Jerusalem, and he sent messengers ahead of him. On their way, they entered a village of the Samaritans to make ready for him, but they, the Samaritans, did not receive him, because his face was set towards Jerusalem. When his disciples, James and John, saw it, they said, Lord, do you want us to command fire to come down from heaven and consume them? But Jesus turned and rebuked them. Then they went on to another village. As they were going along down the road, someone said to Jesus, I will follow you wherever you go. And Jesus said to him, Foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. To another he said, Follow me. But that man said, Lord, first let me go home and bury my father. But Jesus said to him, Let the dead bury their own dead. But as for you, go and proclaim the kingdom of God. Another said, I will follow you, Lord, but let me first say farewell to those at my home. Jesus said to him, No one who puts a hand to the plow and looks back is fit for the kingdom of God. So let's imagine today that we go back in time and we meet an individual who experienced this narrative from Luke's gospel firsthand. I met Jesus for the first time when he was passing by the open-air market in Nazareth where I sell my cloth. Well, I didn't exactly meet Jesus himself. I had a little run-in with some of his followers who were trying to offer me a ridiculously low price for my purple cloth. Those disciples of his, let me be honest, they didn't come off as the brightest bunch of fellows you'd ever meet. I mean, apparently some of them were fishermen and, and day laborers, and there was a rumor that even one of them was a tax collector, if you can imagine that. Word was that he ran around with a pretty strange crowd. I mean, occasionally you'd see him with a Pharisee or another rabbi, but for the most part, it looked like the rabble that were trailing after him were, well, you know who I'm talking about, right? I mean, you saw these people, the the poor, the homeless, prostitutes, even lepers. It was a strange bunch. But it made sense, I guess, based on what he was teaching. He, He kept talking to them over and over about following him on the way. I remember standing in a crowd once when he was teaching this, and the guy next to me said, The way? The way to what? Wherever this ragtag bunch is going, I don't want to follow. And he left. And I could see his point. When I I first came across Jesus and his followers, the last thing that crossed my mind was that one day I might follow him myself. And to be honest, some of what he was preaching, this way of his, it was... It was subversive stuff, even downright dangerous, really. I mean, he's teaching about this thing he calls the empire of God. By the way, that's not something you want to say too loudly around here if you know what's good for you. The the other things Jesus was teaching about loving your neighbor and all, nobody had any problem with that. Heck, the Romans actually liked it, anything to keep their precious Roman peace. But, but this empire of God talk, that was... Uh, That was deeply and dangerously political. Whatever we Jews might say in private, in public we all knew there's only one empire, the empire of Rome, the empire of Caesar. So, at first, I kept my distance. I could see what was coming if he kept up with this kind of talk. We all could. You don't challenge the status quo and expect to be around for very long. So I kept to selling my cloth in the market. I took care of my family. I went to temple, and that was that. Keep your head low and stay out of trouble. That was my motto. The only problem was it seemed like I kept bumping into Jesus and his band of disciples, and my big mistake was listening to what he was saying. I mean, really listening. Because the more he talked, the more he he made sense to me. The more, more I started to think that maybe I'd... I don't know, settled for too little in life. Maybe I'd settled for too small a view of the world. Maybe I'd settled for safe and and comfortable when God was calling me to something more. And so I started purposely following Jesus. Well, not following so much. I, I just hang out in the back of the crowds when he was teaching, listening, but, you know, 
trying to act like I wasn't really with them, just in case the temple authorities or a Roman soldier might happen by. But over time, I got caught up in the whole thing. His vision of a world where we all participate in God's peace and in God's justice and compassion for everyone, that's the sort of thing I'd heard others teach before, but this Jesus seemed to really be living it. So one day I decided to make the move. I decided this is it. Today I really follow Jesus on the way. Today I finally go all in. And so there I was on the road to Jerusalem with him and the others looking for a moment, an opening when I could talk to him. But every time I tried to, there was an interruption. First, it was those disciples of his. He, he'd sent some of them into a nearby Samaritan village to find a place for all of us to stay. But the Samaritans refused us. They didn't want anything to do with Jesus. Let's be honest, we aren't particularly fans of theirs either. But then James and John report this back to Jesus and say, hey, do you want us to send down heavenly fire on them and destroy them? You see what I mean about these disciples? Weren't they listening to Jesus? Did they miss that the way he had been talking about was all about nonviolence, about peace, about loving the enemy? Did they miss all that? And so Jesus' response to them is, no, that's not who we are. That's not who I am. Next, this other fellow who's standing right next to me, who knows I want to talk with Jesus, steps up before I can and tells Jesus that he's ready to follow him. I mean, talk about stealing my thunder. And Jesus says to him this strange thing. He says, foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. I mean, what was that all about? I, I kind of remember him talking once about how King Herod was an old fox, and and he told a parable once about the kingdom of God being like someone sowing seeds, and, and the birds are like scavengers stealing and destroying them. So was this talk of foxes and birds all about how, I don't know, that the wicked have a place to lay their heads, but those who follow him on the way won't find much comfort or security? Well, whatever he meant... That fellow who stepped forward turned right around and headed back home. (laughs) Can you imagine that? Where was his courage? Then another person stepped forward, and before she could say a word, Jesus invited her to follow him. And it really looked like she was up for it, too. But then she says, can I go home and bury my father first? Which, you know, to me sounded like a reasonable request. I mean, the Torah tells us we should honor our parents, and one way we honor them is with a proper burial, right? But what does Jesus say to her? He says, let the dead bury the dead. As for you, go and proclaim the kingdom. What in the world was that all about? Was Jesus suggesting that discipleship, that following him could mean breaking social norms, breaking with the rules of society? Was this what was required for discipleship? To let the grave digger take care of the dead? I don't know. It was a strange thing to say, no doubt. Though at the time, what we didn't know was that Jesus on this way to Jerusalem was on the way to his own burial. But that woman, after hearing all he had to say, she turned around and went back home too. I mean, where was her courage? Finally, it was my turn to speak up, and I said, Jesus, I'm ready to follow you. I'm all in 100%. Just give me a little time to to run home and tell my family, and then I'm all yours. And that just made sense, right? I mean, I had relatives. I had children that would worry if they didn't know what had happened to me. I had to get my affairs in order. But what does Jesus say? He says, no one who puts a hand to the plow and looks back is fit for the empire of God. I wasn't even sure what he meant by that. I mean... Like many of you, I plowed my share of fields in my younger days. I knew that you looked straight ahead or you risked digging a crooked furrow and messing up the whole field. But does following the way mean we have to be that single-minded? I mean, I remember hearing that story of Lot's wife from the Scriptures who looked back at the city of Sodom when God told them not to, and she was turned into a pillar of salt. But was Jesus saying that following him was fraught with similar dangers? Well, it turns out the answer was yes, though I didn't know it at the time. The way of discipleship for Jesus was heading right to Jerusalem, right towards confrontation with the political and religious authorities. He was prepared to give his life for this way of his. 
No one does what he does without expecting death to be a possibility. He he had set his face for Jerusalem and he didn't look back. And now he was inviting me to do the same. I mean, at least he was honest. He says there is a cost to following him. There was a sense of urgency too. I mean, and Jesus is thinking there wasn't time to get our affairs in order. There wasn't time to go back and bury the dead. There wasn't time to go back and take care of things. We couldn't wait for God to fix things anymore. God was waiting for us. Jesus had a way of making you think that following him mattered in this world, that you mattered. But that way of his, it came with a cost. And so that day when when he invited me to be a follower too, I decided to be an admirer instead. I decided to go back home, to, to talk it over with my family, to consider my options. I, I figured that I could always catch with him later, right? I mean, after I took care of everything else, when there was some free time. I mean, some of us have to be admirers, right? Not everybody is made to follow. Though I have to say that since that day, I've often wondered, would following Jesus have shaped a different life for me? Would I be living any differently today if I'd chosen to follow instead of be an admirer? And you know the question that really haunts me even to this day? Does following Jesus change any of the plans for my life? Or do I just fit Jesus into the plans I've already made for myself, wherever and whenever I can fit him in? So what about you? What did you decide to do? To be an admirer or a follower?